Okay. Hi, uh, Matthias. Uh, thanks for joining this session. Um, we've had, um, I had a conversation with Regina, and then I had a conversation with uh, Rusa. So with uh, Regina, we talk about bell film and how plants uh, sort of negotiate uh, with bacteria and manage its uh, microbiota. And with uh, Rusa, we talk about uh, uh, plasticity and adaptation. And um, she also started to ask me about why, you know, what kind of politics I'm thinking about. Okay, so thanks. Uh, thank you very much for joining this session. And um, it's such a nice day, but unfortunately we have to stay inside. Um, but I hope it will be uh, it will be uh, exciting. Uh, I just, I mean, I just say this before I forget. I um, I'm also very grateful to the colleagues that grew up his bow and uh, Sharon Foundation because they really helped to pull this um, together. They actually introduced me to you, and um, that has made my research in Berlin really productive because I started to think about um, plants and politics, but I really didn't know much. I think your research, I mean, your incredible research really helped me now to have a much better understanding of um, what I'm doing and where I'm going. But of course, this is only a start. This is a huge question. And I, I think it's gonna take many iterations to even get to some form. Okay. But before, before we start, I just want to say, um, I'm actually, in, you know, I actually don't want to be bogged down by questions like, uh, I don't want to be trapped in yes or no questions. Like, do plants have intelligence? Is it yes or no? Or, you know, are plants, intel you know, are, do plants have intention, subjectivity, and agency? These are very much yes or no questions. And I often feel these questions come out of our um, arrogance in a way that we assume that they don't. And then it's, I often feel people who raise these questions are not really trying to answer these questions. They're just doubting um, the capability of plants or other forms of life. So actually, I often want to ask like how questions, like how are plants intelligent? How are they capable? Of course, their intelligence and capabilities are very different from our human intelligence and capability. Um, I, I feel these questions probably will just uh, maybe start from humility. For things we don't know, we, we assume that they are intelligent and capable. I think often the sort of modern culture has taken the other direction. For things we don't know, we assume that they are not capable, right? So I, I want to flip this. Rather than ask yes, no questions, we, we focus on how. And perhaps, of course, there's no, never really a definitive, you know, I'm not looking for a de definitive answer how plants, um, whether they are intelligent or not. I think that's beyond the question. So it's really focusing on how. And I also, I want to start with a um, question to you because I have this dilemma where I have this struggle. Even though I'm asking how do plants practice politics, when I, you know, I, I was walking outside, when I see trees, I still immediately just think of them as biological beings. I don't think of them as political beings, right? When I, when, when I encounter a person, I think of the person's cultural heritage. It's, you know, perhaps uh, gender, class, um, you know, the role in a city, et cetera. But when I encounter a plant, I often don't think of these sort of political aspects of existence. So the first question I actually want to ask you, maybe with Matthias to start with, uh, and all of you is, whether you ever in your research, any situation you actually feel that the plants or the fungi or the bacteria are actually political. Do you recall any specific situation that you felt, oh, they're not just biological, they're also political? Hmm. Well, I would have to dig deep, but <laughs> nothing comes immediately to mind. I mean, I mean, you can sometimes be amazed at the level of integration that these organisms can show as deal with environmental stimuli and can integrate them all, how they negotiate their immediate surroundings, how they fit in their communities. <laughs> 
and <laughs> how is, I work in soil mostly, how they're embedded in these complicated networks of interactions. Um, for me, this does not necessarily mean political, but it is certainly it's certainly a very complicated set of interactions in which they are embedded. And of course, there is complexity inside of these organisms as well. But you know, as a as an ecologist, I'm mostly I'm interested in the in the interaction networks, mm -hmm. and they are certainly quite complicated. There's lots of communication going on. Mm -hmm. You talked about it already with Regina, also with her beautiful biofilms. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know there is this. There is, it seems like the, in in the, in that zone around the root, there is this constant chatter going <laughs> on of uh, molecules going back and forth, and all kinds of organisms organisms eavesdropping on the conversation of others, interfering with receiving signals. And so, yeah, no, I mean you can be amazed at that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go so far as saying that this is, uh, has been an experience that made me think of politics per se. <laughs> But you're saying you 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 can so when you're in the field where, where when you're in your lab you don't think they're silent you you can you can you immediately sense that they're talking to each other there's a lot of communication going on right so that that feeling that sensing is very uh, tactile it's very immediate to you sure I mean it's evident that they're communicating you know when they colonize a plant for example there's all the, these fungi that we work with there's of course all kinds of communication going on without that this would not work mm -hmm. and um soil is a particularly interesting medium for me anyways because everybody is just packed into these pore spaces and mm -hmm. such a range of diversity of organisms interacting and they all communicate somehow mm -hmm. So, you know, because, you know, I, I, I keep talking about this immediate sense that arises in me when I encounter these things, because I, I feel like, you know, to shift our mindset, to shift the politics, it's about changing our immediate reactions, to change our immediate sense. So, because most people, when, it's, when we see soil, we think it's dark, it's silent, and there's not much going on, right? So, this is not how you feel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, um... That's correct, of course, Lo, as, as you have already talked to, um, I think, Regina Russo about is that mm -hmm. as, as scientists, we are trained not to do this. We are, we are, we are trained to keep sort of um, our distance from the object <laughs> of the study, right? Otherwise, we run in the danger of being perceived as not objective enough. And that is like a death sentence for a scientist, of right. course. You know, we, we need to keep this kind of professional distance, mm -hmm. if you will, with our organisms. Even though everybody always thinks about like, oh, what it would be like to be a fungus. Right. And I do all the time. And maybe what it would be like to be in a biofilm or what it would be like to be Arabidopsis or right. sure. But um, we are also asked from the professional side to keep this distance. How, how about Regina? Any any sort of political revelation? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether this is a revelation, but I, I think whether we we see politics uh, in 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 all these natural processes depends on how uh, uh, on our definition of politics. So so for me, politics is is the sum of all processes that are required to organize the co-living of, of many individuals in a coherent group, basically. And, and so, uh, I mean, if you, if you take the term politics, it comes from ancient Greek or Greek uh, polis, which means the city, so, or town. So it's, it's all the processes required to organize a town. So it functions well, basically. And, and uh, living beings, all kinds of, they do the same thing. They, they are within species and also between species and so on in, to organize everything in all these, these cycles, basically, in ecological system. So, so all these interactions basically are a form of politics. So if we just broaden this definition to not only include humans, mm -hmm. and I think we, sh we really should do that because we were talking about that. So humans were seen, seen, have seen themselves as separate from nature, which is, of course, a total error and it's, it's destructive. And so we have to reintegrate ourselves into nature. And so we also have to broaden our sense of politics to integrate all the other players in the ecosystem um, where we're living in basically in our planet, on our planet, yeah. I, I, I have probably mentioned in previous conversations with uh, 
all of you, that I've been reading Taoist text, um, the Tao Te Ching text, because um, precisely I feel in that time, you know, 2,500 years ago, the term, yeah, at least in Chinese, the term we use would be Tao, which is kind of eco-politics, right? So it's a broader definition of politics. It's, it's how things are organized on, I mean, there's no sense of planet, but there's how things are organized um, between heaven and earth, how all forms of life are organized. So that, that term we had was Tao. And then now we use a different term for politics, uh, which is Zhengzhi, which is, you know, uh, now immediately just recalls human uh, organization or human practice of organizing things. So we, in Chinese, I'm also thinking this inquiry that I'm starting to do is also precisely like you were saying, to probably broaden our definition, but also to broaden our sensibility. Because I, like I keep saying, it's also about how to change our sensibility. Um, it's not, you know, I often feel I start to, I want to move towards this direction. But I, my, my bodies are not moving. My, my sensibilities are not moving. So it's also about change. Yeah, that's why I asked you if you have any, if you can recall any specific situation where your bodies respond um, um, sort of in a political way to these forms of life. Yeah. I think I, I certainly perceive everything around me, all the living beings, as being very active, or, or be, because we live in these complex systems, and that we use to look at at, at uh, basically resources, and resources uh, is something passive; it's just material that we can act upon. But in in fact, all these uh, are not resources; it's it's uh, even matter is active, basically. So so all the living beings are active; they have their own agenda, and so all this has to need. Uh, has to be negotiated in order for us all, not only humans, but everything else, to live together in a, in a productive, healthy <laughs> environment, basically. Yeah. Right. And, and so when, when I go uh, out in nature, I, I, I can feel that acutely. I mean, uh, my feeling towards, uh, well, plants here, you know? I, I, I know, Bo, you are touching plants, you, you live with them. Yes. And I do the same thing here in my winter garden. For me, this is a living being. Right. Uh, and I look at them every day, and I, this guy here even has little oranges now, and, and mm -hmm. so it's it's uh, it's living being, and I live with it basically. Yeah, and and so this is my acute feeling when I go out in, into nature. Yeah, it's not just a resource; it's not passive; it's super active, and we are all in interrelationship. Yeah. How about you, Rusa? Like any occasion where you felt maybe the uh, the orthodoxies are really becoming political? Yeah, maybe not. I was trying to think if there is any direct example. Maybe not so. But when we were discussing earlier on the phone, and when I was asking you, maybe it was the same questions as Regina said that it all depends of what how we define what politics is, that it might sound the first when you say that that if plants are doing politics, that it's only some human action. But if we define politics, mm -hmm. it actually could include plants as well. And then when I, I was thinking this further, I thought that what could be the political questions mm -hmm. that plants are asking? I mean, we have some political questions, but uh, what that it might not be the same for plants as it is for humans. So the politics in plants might be a bit different than what the humans are right. doing. And uh, But for sure, plants are making decisions. They have to make decisions and they must negotiate. When we also heard from Rakine more this morning. And uh, so there is this kind of, and there is group activities, what they do. They have individual activities, but also one can really feel how there are interactions within group of plants and between the different species. So this one can, whoever walks in the nature can feel, and when we look at the field of plants, that these plants are interacting and interacting with other organisms yeah. as well. Yeah. Before before we go further, I would just remind you that if uh, people have questions and comments, they can type in the um, the chat window. So we will see that, and, and then we will, we can also um, bring in the audience to um, into the question discussion. Uh, so before uh, you know, I, I'll also see what questions come up. And um, but just to follow up on um, this question, Rusa. Let's just imagine. Like I'll ask you to imagine. 
what could be the some of the most important political questions for Arab Dopsis? I mean, I mean, would this just be sort of the same questions that you ask already, or there could be different questions? Are, yeah, you are you asking? You are asking me yeah, maybe asking first. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. What, so, what, what what do Arab Dopsis care right, if we ask this? I mean, what what are their political questions? Yeah. yeah so this is I I think I just uh, this idea or this uh, idea of the questions of the plants came when we were discussing. So I haven't really thought about what kind of political questions they might have. Mm -hmm. But you were mentioning that they need to, for example, prepare for the climate change or the changing environment. So if we think that that's political question, it could be a political question in a way that how do the plant communities react to the or respond to the changing environments and how do they, they how they are kind of yeah, interacting and communicating the signals and the information they receive from the environment. I mean, so, do you think climate change, because I think for me, I think um, I, I, I firmly believe uh, climate emergency is the most important political question. I actually think, you know, it, you know, the, 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 the election in the U.S. is going on, but I actually feel the, uh, you know, more, you know, their demonstration in Hong Kong, et cetera. But I always feel the ecological meltdown is the most important political question for us. Do you, do you and also Matthias, Regina, do you think it's for other species, it's also the most important political question if they, you know, if we can communicate with them? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think so, because I think this goes on, on timescales that are sort of not directly relevant to the timescale um, of organisms under everyday decisions. I mean, they would experience climate change in most cases, bacteria, fungi, microbes, Arabidopsis, most plants, maybe some, with the exception of some very long-lived trees and organisms, they would experience this as sort of a, a slow um, rise in the background that will take place over many, many generations. So I think this does not play an important role in the everyday politics of fungi and plants. Right. So this this kind of goes back to the question we were talking about earlier with Rusa too, this time scale issue, right? Because we are trying to address this in one generation, right? So it, it seems to be within and also, we have a different um, model. We have this. We were talking about this earlier about that we can predict and try to modify our behavior in one generation. But as an ecologist, you're saying that in they they don't operate on this time scale, right? That's not the most important question for them. Uh, but in the long run, over a longer period of time. And because this will not just happen in one generation, right? So it, it will, you know, maybe it may happen in the next 30, 40 years, but it may just over the next few centuries. So could this also, in the long run, also become one of the most important questions for them? Of course, I, I'm thinking, you know, for, for species that face extinction, this would definitely be the most important question, I would imagine, right? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, if you, yeah, if you the habitat in which you currently live becomes unavailable because environmental parameters have moved out of your range, right. um, then it will be very much <laughs> perceived by you, and you gotta pack up and move. Yeah, it's migration of species and entire communities. So if you cannot do that fast enough, you will go extinct locally or completely. Yes. Regina, any thought on this? Like. Yeah. Um, so Matthias is actually thinking about the whole population. Um, so, so, but we can also think of individual, let's say, plants, the single trees, or so, or uh, any any animal, and uh, which is uh, exposed to, let's say, slowly rising temperature on a on a year to year basis. And and I think uh, all these uh, animals and plants, they 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 will be exposed also on a short time range to slightly increased levels of stress. 
Mm -hmm. And so stress is, is, is slowly rising, basically. So I think they will feel it, and they will be pushed out of potential optimum, whatever. And 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 then, as a population, of course, they 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 will react by by migrating uh, if they can, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. But I think at uh, also at a shorter time scale, this is um, this is uh, received or this information is actually present for for plant or even for bacteria. Yeah. And it's not even only the mean that's changing, so I completely agree, but it's also, you know, the peaks yeah, and, and those <laughs> I immediately felt, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So does it, so let's, I mean, if this is one of the most important political questions, how do they address it? But you, I, I, I keep getting the sense that they don't address it in the same way, right? Because it's not a behavior prediction, behavior model. Right. So how how could you know? Um, Rusa looks at um, plasticity, adaptation. How 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 would you imagine you know fungi uh, plants address this change? Maybe beyond a plasticity, any other forms of um, addressing this from their life? Well, if you're asking me as a as a as an ecologist, I would answer. Yeah, there is there is the plasticity, which is sort of the immediate physiological response. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, there is evolutionary responses. And at the same time, to all of these, there is community compositional responses. Mm -hmm. This is the standard answer ecologists would give you that all of these changes occur somehow at the same time. Mm -hmm. Almost nobody studies them all at the same time. Uh -huh. uh, but this is the reality, and then the entire community um, shifts in terms of community composition, physiological um, parameters of the organisms that are in that community, and their population level ev evolutionary trajectories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so basically, every organism in a con uh, species in a in, in in a community has a certain range for adaptation, and and uh, for a certain time, most of them will will be able to adapt. Okay, the level of stress will go up, but then I think that there will be um, the point where certain species drop out. Mm -hmm. because they are at the end of their range basically and then the composition of the community will actually change and then the the, the whole change for the community accelerates basically because it becomes suboptimal and eventually will will break down yeah so that's how i would imagine it yeah mm -hmm. And, and then on a longer time scale, uh, the, 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 the species and the, the communities, they can react by evolution. And of course, bacteria can react much faster because they have this very rapid uh, generation time. So, so the evolutionary adaptation is fastest for bacteria. So they are the ones who will be best <laughs> in coping with these uh, right. changes, probably. And there's there's connection between adaptation and transformation, right? Because we are we are not only at, like we were talking earlier, we're not only adapting, we're also transforming. By adapting to climate change, by by changing our behavior, we are also transforming the temperature rise, right? So it, these two are linked. Is it correct? We can basically react very, very rapidly because we can, uh, I mean, we, we are not uh, confined to genetic changes or genetic adaptation. We have all the cultural level on top of that. And this is, uh, this can adapt much faster. Yeah. Um, but I, I was saying whether, uh, you know, when we talk about plants, it's also not just, when you talk about plants individual and also population change, it's not just, uh, adaptation by adapting they're also changing the climate system right so there's yeah, also they're also yes yeah. in cycles so we actually in, in all our discussions so far we have always uh, looked at the environment something which is outside of of the actors basically and and how they react they respond they get uh, they adapt etc but basically but but uh, but plants and bacteria and animals all the living beings are doing at least in in nowadays on on this planet is that they actually uh, affect and control and determine the environment yes. we have all these geochemical biological cycles right, and, right. and uh, so basically the living world is determining also the environment so it, it goes both way in, in circles basically yeah 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 i mean I, I just want to bring this up because it's not just adapting it's also transforming so it's still always um happening at the same time yes. 
Yeah. Okay. There's one. I got one comment. So there's uh, Christian. He's saying um, hi there. I was thinking how community and communication played a crucial role for human evolution and intelligence. Would you say this is a case for plants as well? So I'll just read this again. I was thinking how community and communication played a crucial role in human evolution intelligence. Would you say this is a case for plants as well? Right. I mean, we were talking about communication earlier when uh, Rusa and I were uh, on the phone. Rusa, do you, do you think communication is also very important for the evolution of uh, plants? Yes, I do think, I mean, communication and the interactions that occur. We also talked about the networks, which is uh, full of uh, connections and uh, like everything is connected. And I think that it does, uh, it does play a role in evolution, but how, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I, I think the question was about uh, the intelligence or what it was about plant evolution as a whole or plant evolution of certain, um, yeah, it says communication, the, the role of communication in human evolution and intelligence, right? I think communicate, I, I, I'm, I, I'm sort of focusing on one, one part of the question. Rather than communication's role for intelligence, I'm just saying communication's role for evolution, right? Whether, whether plants communication also has any role in its evolution. And there is also a lot of co-evolution happening also in plants and in nature, which really it's very important. Maybe I think Matthias and Regine are working. Well, Matthias, for sure, if you work with the fungi and plants and the interaction, so you might right. have something more to say about this or more examples. Is communication just part of the co-evolution? I would say so, yeah. I think um, there is, I mean, a good example is with AM fungi, apascular mycorrhizal fungi, the things that we work with, they have this ability to communicate with plants in specific ways. So the plant recognizes them as friend. Right. And um, there is evidence that part of that conversation has actually been borrowed by other plant symbionts like end fixing bacteria. And they use some of the same conversation pieces that have been borrowed in evolution most likely and uh, also engage in a symbiosis so this is one example where communication has definitely been super important for evolution i think i, I actually i am now i'm thinking um maybe christian was asking about communication within the community uh, let's say the communication within one human community that help us to become intelligent. But I actually thought this is interesting. We start to talk about intraspecies communication already, right? Because we, when we talk, when we think about communication for humans, we tend to to limit our thinking just to intra-human communication, which is actually a, a, I mean, to me, that's a that's a huge limitation, right? So now I'm, I think it's, it's actually interesting to think about intra-species communication, whether that has to do with our intelligence. It, I mean, to flip the question, whether intra-species communication is important for our intelligence, right? I I, I mean, I'll just say something, and then I, I I'll turn it to you, Regina. I'm sure we also have intra-species intra communication, like we were talking about the microbiota in our gut. So our body is communicating with the microbes, except it's 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 using molecular language rather than rather than sort of human language, right? So we often don't put them together. Right. Regina, you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah, something a bit more general. So basically communication is what is required to organize a community. And a community is certainly a higher form of organization, a more complex uh, form of organization than just existing as an individual. So when we go from simple system, like, like a single bacteria, to a community, which is a biofilm, to a, a, to a, a multicellular organism, and a multicellular organisms getting together to community, think of bees or, or uh, termites and so on, humans. I mean, it's it's uh, different levels of organization which become more and more complex, require more and more communication, and of course also imply higher forms of intelligence. Um, so I think it starts with the bacteria, it goes up to humans. It's, it's a very general principle, I would say. And I want to ask a bit more about this intra-species communication, right? Um, because I think that's something that we often don't think about as humans. Right? 
sleep, right? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, I'll turn to you, Matthias, a little bit. We can talk a little bit more and also see how, how where this goes. So do AM fungi and then the, uh, the root system of plants, when they communicate, it's intraspecies communication, but there's also uh, sort of with uh, interspe like within species, there's there are two sorts of communication going on, right? So how do these two sets of in, in, uh, communications interact? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, I was just asking myself that as well. <laughs> I mean, uh, what I would, wanted to emphasize first is that when we're talking about communities of humans, we're talking about with, within one species, really, when we're talking about communities of plants, we very much talk about a completely wildly different kind of communication. Right. It's all different species. It's the same right. word, but it's, it's, I think it can be quite confusing. Um, yes, I mean, there can be um, communication there is communication of course within one mycelium of a fungus um, there can be um, communication in the sense like don't grow there i'm already here so they um, basically you know keep themselves separate from each other so they don't grow on top of each other so they don't um, compete too much within each other because it would be bad for overall fitness and this communication has to be aligned and integrated with the communication with the plant which is completely separate and different. Mm. So different different compounds or different uh, signals are used for different uh, sorts of communication, right? And different currencies, you know, I mean, the exchange with the plant is a, is it is a, is an economic trade. It's been described exactly with these words as a market, right. you know, where the plant gives the fungus carbon and nutrient, the fungus gives the plant nutrients. So there's also trafficking of material involved. Uh, whereas within the mycelium, it would be signaling molecules that are being transported or, you know, environment being sensed. So yes, they are, they are different. Yes, go ahead, Regina. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's a very nice example uh, of um, uh, communication within a species and between species in, in bacteria. And, and this is again quorum sensing that we were talking about. So, so bacteria making molecules and they're being sensed by, by other bacteria. And uh, so, so usually bacteria have several, several languages. So, so they make a very specific molecule which is recognized only by, by other bacteria of their own species. So they know how many of their siblings are around the same species, basically, when they sense this, this, this particular molecule. However, at the same time, they also tend to produce uh, some other molecules which are more general, which are produced by all bacteria. So at the, with this molecule, they actually communicate with all the different bacteria species around them. So they get an idea how many bacteria total are there. So, so all these all other bacteria, if different species, they, for instance, they all compete for nutrients. Mm -hmm. But if, if uh, a certain species wants to do something with its own uh, species partners, then it needs the other language basically and communicates just with its own species. And they actually can differentiate between that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's something that comes to my mind. Okay, there are two things. One is whether the within species communication, at least for bacteria, it's molecule. And then um, between different species bacteria, it's also molecule, right? Yes, but different ones. Yeah, different ones. But for us, we use sort of a audio um, uh, visual language to communicate within us. But when we communicate with other species, I mean, uh, primarily now just with microbes, right? Because we, we I, I don't know whether how, how we communicate with other animals and plants, but with microbes and then it's on the microbe level, right? So these two languages are very different, right? I wonder, I mean, if it's just a, if it's just a animal situation or, you know, in plants, they also have, you know, I, I, you, you can sense where I'm going, right? With this question, right? So whether plants also have two completely two complete different forms of language when they communicate within community, when they, when they communicate with other species. I mean, we have this particular situation where the two languages are on completely different forms and different mediums, right? And also, I mean, the related, related question, I think is, you know, I, it sounds to me as a scientist, you studied both, right? You studied both uh, communication signals within the ones 
bacteria or for people who study quantum sensing, they could look at, you know, the molecules within one bacteria species, and then they can also look at two different bacteria species. So they actually can look at both equally. But in our situation, in our academy, there are sort of li linguists who study the human communication, and then there are people like biologists who study how we communicate with microbes. So we, we, we have this huge divide. It kind of goes, I mean, I haven't thought about this. So this is also, an, this is another manifestation of the culture nature divide in a way, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. We, we actually also, as humans, we, we use additional languages that we are uh, very often not aware of. For yeah. instance, smell. So, so basically, uh, all the things that we can perceive with our senses, is uh, we can also use that as for communication. And, and one is smell and, and um, touching. Right. Uh, so it's not just language. So we also have a repertoire of very different kinds of, of ways of communicating, basically. Yeah, but we, we, we privilege this sort of linguistic um, form. Um, I mean, I mean now too, right? Because you know we're we're we were physically separated, so we can't really smell each other. We can only hear and maybe see each other, right? So that's that's also not very. Yeah. You know. um, just just to ask this one more time, um, uh, for so for fungi, Matthias the communication within the high feed network and the communication between uh, fungi and tree roots are these two forms of communication in different mediums or they are just different molecules but they're still on, they're, you know they're still using molecules no i think they're just different molecules mm -hmm. and i think this is also the case with when you said with plants, I think plants also communicate with other plants via sometimes via that mycelial linkage in the soil where information molecules can travel from mm -hmm. one plant to another plant via that linkage of the fungus. Mm -hmm. And above ground plants communicate, for example, via volatiles. Mm -hmm. So there are also different uh, compounds and mm -hmm. certain plants can perceive them, they can be calls for help or like uh, or warning more <laughs> they can be calls for help or they can be warning they can attract like the parasite of a herbivore that attacks the plant so it's call for help uh, totally crazy interspecies communication if right. you like. and uh, the same also happens below ground with root um, herbivores and attracting the parasites of the root herbivores by the plant releasing volatiles and then plants can warn each other above ground by releasing volatiles and say like, warning, there is a herbivore eating meat, maybe also coming your way, right. a good idea to upregulate defense. But those are also different molecules than the molecules that are used for communicating with the fungi, for example. I mean, I start to, I start to think about this uh, actually, um, I mean, I'm sure for you it's very basic, right? The molecular language is actually much more important than so-called our human language. Um, I hope someday maybe there will be some form of sort of like Google translation. We can just translate all the molecular signals, and so all of us understand there's so much, so much going on. And um, because what we can speak is actually a very limited set of the natural languages that are um, happening. But yes. I think that uh, we are also have a lot of communication at the molecular level that we are also maybe not thinking right. Right. as much as actively. So we often when we, because we think from the human perspective very often many things. So for us, when we talk about communication, we are directly thinking of uh, the way we speak and uh, the, the way humans communicate. And we don't even think of this other way of communicating that we have and uh, well it could also be that we are actually communicating less with the nature because we are not aware of all these ways that we could maybe use for communication so we like the other like plants they they need to communicate what is around them and with the other organisms and other species but we don't really and as we say, plants are, plants cannot move anywhere, so they really have to communicate everything that comes near. Then we can also just walk away, so we can also avoid communication. So I think that's a big difference to to 
the natural things or the plants especially yeah so i mean we're, we're talking today so we're using we're using the human language but I, I you know i really start to feel i should spend more time not talking in my everyday situation of course you know last time when i was talking to matthias we were stuck on the way and then we talked for like 11 hours right <laughs> but whenever it's possible every day i try to spend some time not talking you know when i'm drawing i'm not using my linguistic uh, uh sense um yeah I, I'll read more comments and see how um, the response. Uh, so Lucia Maher, she's, I believe she, she and she said, Bio, um, bionics would be the most popular example of human learning from plants. Are there other areas where humans picked up on plant knowledge? Um, so she's saying um, we learn from plants. So there's this field called bionics, um, but are there other areas where we can learn from plants that I understand this is her question, right? I mean, we talk of, I mean, when we were talking earlier with Regina, we were saying, um, you know, your research shows how, how we can learn from plants, how to, but it's not learning even, it's just using their products, right? Um, well, we also learn from it uh, and, and how they use it and, 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 yeah, I think I would call that learning from plants. It's not just exploitation. I, I see it as a learning from the plants because I, I, I do not only see the molecule. I, I try to, to understand when and why the plant is making it so. So to understand the strategy behind it, it's more than just knowing the molecule. It's I, I, I really want to understand the biology by, behind it. And, and that means the strategies. And, and so when, when I write my proposals, I, I, I don't only write we want to, to find molecules, but mm -hmm. we want to understand the strategies. And, and because that uh, gives us also the possibility to, well, it's more than just a molecule, it's um, to understand the general principles. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more possibilities to actually use it than just a simple molecule. Yeah? So can you, can you give an example? Because I mean, I, I certainly got a very limited picture. Um, then it's just focusing on the, the compound EGCG of the green tea plant. So when you say a strategy, let's say if, uh, let's say green tea plant strategy, what is their strategy beyond just producing the EGCG? Yeah, I mean, it has to do with, uh, with the target. So, so what they actually hit in the bacterium, yeah? And initially we thought uh, about what would be good targets? How could you actually inhibit biofilm formation, knowing all that, uh, how it is regulated in bacteria and so on? We came up with a number of interesting targets. So, so some things like a certain type of signaling, mo uh, signaling molecule, which is produced inside, but in all bacteria, they all use it for promoting biofilm formation. So if you hit this path pathway, you, you would actually be able to inhibit biofilm formation from many bacteria. We never found that a plant actually uses this particular pathway. And then we realized why? Because it is an inside pathway in the bacterial cell. And, and especially our, our gram-negative E. coli bacteria, they have a very complicated cell envelope. There are two membranes and membranes is lipid basically. And then so they, a molecule would have to traverse the two membranes in order to get inside. And so we realized what the plant are really doing, they're evolving compounds that act from outside, which is much more simpler. And, and so we, they have the, the, the compounds that directly eliminate or, or inhibit the assembly of these fibers, or they trigger a reaction of the bacteria uh, by actually binding at the outside or, or disturbing a little bit the outer membrane, basically. And then the bacteria senses it, and the information about that actually travels inside. It's not the molecule. Yeah. So the plants have way, ways to, uh, to uh, found ways to affect the bacteria in the most simple way, that is from outside. So, so they don't have, the, 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 the molecules don't have to go through all the membranes to hit inside. So even though we would have perfect targets inside, they're not being used because the molecules would not reach it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is an important insight, a general insight that we have come up with beyond just finding this or that molecule. Yeah? Um, I, I'm thinking what you told me last time, Matthias, how ants do farming and uh, how they use uh, antibiotics. Do you, do you want to just say that um, uh, briefly? Like particularly how they use antibiotics. 
Right, yeah, this is exactly what I was thinking about. <laughs> what I was thinking about right now. It's, it's just not with plants. So, right. but there is, um, you know, there's a couple hundred species of these attine ants, and they are the leaf cutter ants. So they um, cut leaves in the tropical rainforest. You can see the streets of these ants bringing like huge pieces of leaf back into their nests, but they actually don't ever eat these leaves. What they eat exclusively are the fungi that they farm on these leaves in every sense of the word it's been even um the analogy to farming has been worked out in in incredible mind-blowing detail actually and so what they do is also just like we when we farm we have to fight weeds right. we use herbicides and they use um a specific fungicide so that it's like whenever there is a situation too good to be true it's like this perfect culture that these uh, ants do with these uh, fungi there's always some guy that goes in and tries to crash the party and this is a specific nest uh, parasite called escovopsis and what the ants have on their um, thorax or whatever this thing is called in ants they have like this growth of actinobacteria sorry it's a bacteria story but <laughs> they're almost as cool as fungi because they're linear and filamentous so they so they have this <laughs> they have this little puddle of antibiotic on their surface and when they, the ants um, discover this, um, this infection, they cut it out and they rub it on themselves and basically kill off that, um, that fungus. But the remarkable thing, and I don't know how that story really played out in the last year or two, but um, you might wonder, why didn't that fungus re evolve resistance? And so the, the very compelling answer to that that I've heard is that when that ant walks around with this puddle of antibiotic on itself, it recruits fairly randomly from the environment an assemblage of bacteria that also produce antibiotics, but in a completely random way. And what you cannot evolve resistance against is randomness. This is completely unpredictable. So there is probably this main antibiotic by this streptomyces isolate that they also hand on from queen to queen to queen. But then there is these randomly acquired, um, you know, uh, other additional secondary antibiotics that they also have in there. And it seems like, oh my God, if we could use that, it could be so amazing because <laughs> it would solve a major issue, which is this antibiotic tolerance. Um, so I don't know if, if there's companies or other people working on that right now. I assume so very much, but it, that is a, that's a great lesson to learn, I think. Yeah, I mean, this, to, to me, you know, I, I keep thinking about this and I thought there's this is also, I mean, to me, this is also very much political in a sense, because when we think about politics, we tend to think about coordination, right? So what you are saying, and there's sort of also the politics of randomness, right? For this is very much part of the evolutionary force that we, uh, we have to uh, heed to, right? So then I think often when we talk about politics, it's about uh, cohesion or coordination. Um, of course, we also talk about diversity, right? So perhaps diversity is precisely to increase variability, what we talked about earlier with Rusa, and also to think about maybe maybe randomness. And then I was also thinking about the Taoist idea of non-action, non uh, not doing too much, because if we do too much, we actually reduce randomness. Um, um, you know, if we, if we do less, perhaps the random factors actually manifest and balance what we do. So there's a better balance between cohesion and um, variability and randomness, right? So I don't know whether this, you know, I, 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 I assume in ecology or biology, this is also fundamental to, to you, um, to your research and also to think about evolution. Right? Um, we, I mean, earlier, um, when I was talking to Rusa, we were talking about population variability, right? So there's, well, you also mentioned uh, uh, plasticity could be uh, uh, sort of variation plasticity. When environmental conditions change, the variation also, there could be more variation or less variation. That's also a form of, uh, that could also be a form of plasticity, right? Did I get this right? Yeah. Yes, I think we talked. We, we talked about uh, yeah. We first talked about plasticity as a trait in an individual, but I think we then also talked that the 
that all the populations can show plasticity and there can be variability in the plasticity within one population mm -hmm. as well as in communities and in ecosystems uh, there can be plasticity also and uh, this is interesting of course to study and how these different things are connected how but I, I think that i didn't we didn't really talk about the plasticity of the variation but rather like that the plasticity different in within one population can vary between the individuals so there is also population level plasticity mm -hmm. as well mm. um, um, just maybe to get some basic uh, sense is is variation sort of related to the randomness that matthias was talking about not necessarily right so there are many different not necessarily i think variation often so Genetic, well, yeah, I mean, it's created by, so if we think from, if we talk about genetic variation with underlies, I think a lot of the phenotypic variation, it comes from the genetic differences, which is coming from, for example, mutations, which are random. But then what kind of variation is kept in the population, that's not any more random process. So it's due to natural selection, which is very much non-random i mean matthias you can maybe correct or say if you agree with this view but i think that there is a ra underlying randomness a very, very random mutations and the genetic variation comes from a random process but then the way it's selected it's non-random non-random process sure how you know th th this is just a, a question um I haven't thought about this. I mean, this has just come up in my mind as we talk. How can we incorporate, how can we incorporate randomness in our political imagination? Because I mean, I, I, I think even for me, I start to, you know, of course I'm reading Dali's text, which is really a lot about sort of accepting what happens um, and, you know, uh, this idea of chance, right? So how, do you from your research and you know just reflecting in as a human too how is incorporating randomness an important political um, uh, strategy for us i mean um when you talked to rusa earlier you mentioned uh, how important it is to consider multiple factors Mm -hmm. um, in, in plant responses. And yeah. this is also something that um, in our lab, we are very, very interested in, in how we can um, deal with so many factors that influence any kind of process or organism. And the way that we came up with um, dealing with this issue is we have a huge pool of factors, let's say 10 or 30 factors, environmental factors, global change factors or whatever. And we randomly pool randomly take from this pool a subset of factors, let's say two. Mm -hmm. Every replicate of factor level two has a different combination of these factors. We do the same with factor level three or five. Mm -hmm. And so we, we use random selection from a pool as a way to study multi-factor influences. And I have been thinking about how this could also be used in management. You know, I mean, in management, you also have a situation where you have to deal with so many factors at the same time. Nobody can do these experiments. It's logistically, financially, and ethically impossible. <laughs> but what if we actually used random factor combinations to just set up some trials, just, just sample from this almost infinite pool of factors, just pull at random some mm. combinations and set this up and see if just by chance there is some stuff that works really well. <laughs> I mean, you could probably also do that in politics. I'm not sure it would be ethical, <laughs> but you, right. could, you could from the, from, the, from the pool of possible regulations and combinations of things that you could do, you could <laughs> randomly pool some of them, pool, sorry, pull some out of this pool and then have them work and see which ones of those work best and then work further on those promising combinations of factors. Mm -hmm. Just an idea, <laughs> probably not practical. 
Yeah, of, I mean, of course, the, the planet is the biggest experiment, right? So it's running all these experiments. I mean, that's part of what, I, I, I guess that's part of what evolution means, right? It's just this huge um, experiment going on, yeah. That's right. I mean, this is happening. Um, this is um, this is the, this mo mosaic theory of evolution that there's like out there. There is all kinds of evolutionary factors that are distributed across the landscape, and it yeah. creates all kinds of almost probably random combinations of drivers that organisms have to respond to. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. How, how, like, I mean, you mentioned ants, they not only can adapt to randomness, they actually, um, in, in a way, it sounds like they actively take advantage of randomness, right? Do, do you think, I mean, for, 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 for all of you, do you think other forms of life have strategies like the ants that they really know how to adapt to randomness or sort of even take advantage of randomness. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so, so we tend to think of, of randomness as something more negative or destructive or just by chance, so that order cannot come out of chance. But actually, also bacteria make, make some creative use of randomness. So, for instance, uh, sometimes you find that uh, a population of bacteria is not all the same. I mean, the same species under the same conditions, so they experience all the same signals from the out, from outside. But still, they divide in certain subpopulations that behave differently. For instance, you have two subpopulations. One is is growing slowly and and uh, is very resistant against all kinds of stresses, and and the other one uh, puts everything into growth. And they coexist basically. And this is actually a very adaptive strategy in under conditions that may change. So. So basically, one of these populations may have an advantage under the given situation, but the other population will suddenly have an advantage when the when the uh, pop, when the conditions change. So basically, this is called bed hatching. So so the 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 bacterial population expresses several phenotypes, several ways of behavior, and only one is optimal at the moment. But they take into account basically that things might change, and then suddenly the other subpopulation may have an advantage or may not be, might not be killed. So this is a creative use of of uh, of random basically and and you can also see that in their genes uh, the way how they establish different subpopulation means they have uh, activated different genes under conditions which are identical because they're all at the same place basically they are exposed to the same conditions so it's not a response to the environment but they have mechanisms in place which actually create uh, uh, or they use bistable switches so basically, uh, this is a switch situation where you are in a certain range of conditions internally now in a cell that the outcome is unpredictable. It can go this way or this way. And and, and so you have these two subpopulations and, and cells that have decided this way and others that have gone this way. And and so, but it's random. And you can see in, in the regulation how these circuits are arranged. It's very interesting, very uh, nested positive feedbacks, for instance. They, they produce this kind of behavior. And and so, so it's a creative use of randomness. It's it's very adaptive at the end, in principle, in a complex world that can change over time. Yeah. I, I just realized, you know, um, I hope this doesn't sound like libertarian politics, right? To to advocate sort of complete chaos or individual uh, choice, whatever randomness, right? So I hope there. Are, I mean, we're running out of time, but I, I guess there must be some distinction between uh, this our our fascination with randomness with just pure liber libertarian um, politics. Um, oh, it's still controlled randomness, but you can use it. Yeah. <laughs> There's actually one uh, one other uh, question that just sent to me, but I actually think we're out of time. But maybe it's good to 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 actually end with questions rather than answers. So there's one question um, from Christopher asked if we assume politics to be shaped by at least some variant uh, values, are uh, there equivalents like moral or ethical values to plants? So this is actually something I also was thinking. You know, how do we think about? Uh, 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 ethics and morals and justice and equality that's actually on my to think list um like i said this is only just to start the conversation and uh, sort of start the, the inquiry i 
maybe I'm thinking maybe next year I should just call random scientists and see whatever answers. <laughs> yeah, but this has been a very coordinated uh, project for us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, and um, we'll be in touch. Okay. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Rosa, and thank you, Regina. Yeah, it's great. <laughs>